Hello and welcome to Folk Tales and Fantasy, the podcast where we talk about all things fantasy and more. My name is Cameron Michaels and I have a guest with me to talk with me about the Lord of the Rings, the Return of the King specifically. Hello, I'm Blake, uh, Blake Murphy, and as far as for some of my background into uh, fiction, fantasy, folklore, uh, I was a part-time screenwriting and uh, science fiction writing student at Arizona State University, um, won a couple of story contests back in high school, feels like it was forever ago, but still passionate about that and was glad to join Cameron on this podcast. Nice, nice. So today... We're going to be finishing off the Lord of the Rings with Return of the King. And Blake, I know you know a lot more about like the general consensus of like, I don't know if there's a main opinion on the Lord of the Rings specifically because the last book, The Return of the King, is a lot different. At least this was the first time I ever read the Lord of the Rings all the way through Mm. and was not expecting the return of the king as someone who had only watched the movies growing up for it to end the way it did. And I could see a lot of people not really enjoying the way it ended because what is it? The last third, the last whole third of the book is literally after Sauron is defeated and they're just kind of picking up the pieces and if I'm honest, I feel like The Return of the King is my favorite of the three. I mean, it's not as action-packed as The Two Towers, because, you know, they have Helm's Deep, the Battle of Isengard, but I... Shelob's Lair and the end where they've got Frodo is kidnapped by the enemy, leaving on a very big cliffhanger. Yeah. Very different as far as the tone, like you mentioned, from the movie to the book. I remember the first time that I watched The Two Towers... And I was told by my mother that I could not watch any of the movies until I finished the books. Hmm. So I checked out The Fellowship of the Ring from the library. They had gotten the VHS back in the day that they had bought and said, you can't watch this until you finish the book. And I read through that entire book in six hours when I was like 12 years old. It's like, all right, Mom, I'm done. Let's watch the movie tonight. And when I watched Two Towers for the first time... I was in the same. I was in a different mindset. Where I went, wait, there's. They still have to go to the tower in Shelob's lair, and I realized that the movie was going to end at a very different point. And some of that, I think, is the adaptation from movie to film and different narratives. Mm-hmm. It's much, much quicker in terms of the book and how it moves along to Helm's Deep. And the movie spent a lot more time and detail on the battle itself, a little bit less on Frodo and Sam and their journey. Cinematically, it was pleasing to see then Frodo and Sam in Return of the King essentially see that be their storyline in a lot of ways, along with Aragorn. But the book is so different in that the book is almost like shows you the aftermath. And in most movies, you never truly get to see the aftermath. or You don't get to see the romantic comedy where they go on, go home, settle down, get married, start having kids. The usual ending for a movie is there's the happy ending and brief, and you see maybe a hint or two. Whereas what Tolkien did, I think, was in describing the rest of the world, you really got to see the impact, both positive, on relationships, on taking back, essentially, the throne, and some of the negatives, like the controversial scoring of the Shire ending that was left out of the movie. Was it controversial that it wasn't in the movie, or controversial that it was in the books? It was both, from what I know. Some purists wanted it to be something that was in the books, because you essentially get to see these kind of tried-and-true, trepid adventurers coming back from their... Uh, journeys kicking butt and taking names in their hometown. You get to Mm -hmm. see how different it was from the beginning. A lot of people thought that was integral to their character development and thought it should be in the movie. It also would have closed off some of the Saruman, uh, kind of given him that proper finale that we really only saw in the extended version that was kind of an adapted version of the scoring of the Shire. And then you get to see the characters settle in. And what was cool is it did show the impact of Mortar made its way across the entire world from a world building standpoint it worked it was also though considered to be one of the low points of the book because you're right the tale is done everything's finished they spend this whole section about the four hobbits having to just go back kick butt for each of the things and then the reveal that saruman was the one behind it a 
powerless Saruman. A lot of people were, I think, just feeling like the adventure was over. Here comes another whole Like, adventure. wrap it up already. Yeah, wrap yeah. it up already for that. We know that the hobbits aren't going to die here. We know that eventually Saruman's going to get what his is. Like, you know where it's coming. And so it was almost a case of you look at how the book works as a tale and a narrative. You look at how the world Tolkien built as a narrative. And it wasn't a really cinematic ending, and so a lot of people thought it was actually an improvement when it was left out of Peter Jackson's movie. And seeing how the pacing was and how we're used to understanding stories, it's like, it's kind of hard to disagree, but it would be kind of nice to see some of the hobbits coming back and just kicking butt for all the people it overtaken, because, you know, you look at that in Fellowship of the Ring... They were just powerless. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, Tolkien and then they're like that. they come back as like veterans of war. Merry mm-hmm. and Pippin especially are like, don't they become like they like in, are in Shire legend just for that specific battle oh, against yeah. Yeah. battle of the Shire? Yes. yes, they end up having all of these aspects of war and other big events. And in the movies, it's kind of just you have your little happy ending, and they spend a lot more time on the less about what happened to the characters and. More just gets back to normal, and then they had the tearful farewell, which kind of introduced that twist of Frodo leaving as well, which was something that also existed in the book, but it was done and handled a much more dramatic way in the movie because it felt like less time had passed than right. in all of the years all and over again in the book, which, when it comes to building worlds, it's part of why a lot of people love those details that go into a fantasy world that you, you know, we never get to see Legolas and Gimli essentially after one aspect and in rest of Tolkien's world building we know exactly what happens to them dude's an absolute master class of world building that was the thing that struck me right off the bat like in the fellowship of the ring the fellowship of the ring I've said this before but it's probably my least favorite of the three um probably just because I feel there are a lot of aspects I really like all of Tolkien's world building it's all amazing in my opinion but there are aspects of it in Fellowship of the Ring that I didn't feel were as integral as the stuff that I feel like a lot of the description is focused in on the story and more in The Two Towers and Return of the King. And honestly, I could see a lot of people going either way, as you said, um, on whether the ending is good in the movie or in the book. And honestly, I don't feel feel like either side is wrong necessarily Mm. i think it would be really hard to take the ending that tolkien did in the books and adapt it in a way that felt satisfying for movies because it's two different types of media and sure in for it already to be controversial when the books came out like all this is taking forever it's a really gutsy way to end the story and i think it's honestly more i will say i think it's more realistic than the movie's ending simply because when a war when sauron's defeated when a dark lord the leader of an army is defeated not all of the aspects of war just end all of Mm -hmm. the suddenly yes and that's where i think if you wanted to look into the tolkien film that came out where the movie tried to look at his experience of world war one as inspiration um, Peter Jackson even seems to understand some of this as a movie that he did about World War One called They Will Not Grow Old that showed some of the horror and tragedy of war. Mm. And when all of these boys came back from the time in the trenches with injuries, PTSD... Um, they're not the same person. They're not the same person. And the fact that most of the world, since the fighting was all kept to these trenches and these specific spots and areas, was so far away from the populace. In some cases, like the United States... It was on the complete opposite side of the globe. They didn't get involved until the Lusitania sunk. There were World War One veterans coming back who no longer fit into society. It would almost be like if we're going to look at it in modern terms, there was a country that had no idea that any sort of like COVID-19 pandemic had happened, was isolated from it, and didn't really have any understanding of going to another country and looking around being like, wait, what? What? what's all these signs? What's going on here? Like, and There was a gap of, um, I guess you could say, in between the war veterans coming back, which I thought was well captured in the in the movie. What mm-hmm. Tolkien, I think, did instead was try to basically take some of his experience and his suffering, right. and he poured some of that into the Shire being taken over as well. And so maybe you could say it's almost like maybe a little bit of Tolkien fan fiction of, if my place had been taken back over, here's what I would have done if you're seeing some of yourself in the characters 
And some of it, I think, at least, is recognizing that a lot of when we write is being able to create worlds and create characters. Um, my favorite part of how Fellowship works is how the character dynamics are established very, very well in yeah. a way that we never saw in The Hobbit. We didn't get specific personal aspects of each of the different dwarves like you do with the members of the Fellowship. They don't really have arcs. They're just kind yeah. of... The only one who's got an arc is Thorin, and the only other one, at least, that they tried to give an arc to in Peter Jackson's movies was, I believe it was Feely, yeah. and it was the awkward elf-dwarf relationship that no one really seemed to approve of. <laughs> So the the first official like uh, elf dwarf pairing most people joke about was supposed to be Legolas and Gimli. So oh, <laughs> they're BFFs, you know, Jonathan yeah, and David yeah. type situation for that one for biblical scholars. So I I think with when you're looking at all of these things kind of combined, like you said, with the world building, the ending is probably the most controversial part, and I don't think it's the very very ending. Like the very ending of the book is a mirror of how it all began. Very first book, The Hobbit, green door, Bilbo Baggins, someone knocks on the door for that one as if they're arriving for a party. Entire series essentially ends with Tolkien's writing of Sam walking back home, a new owner, a new kind of path for that one, but then a finality to all of the adventures. And he's like, well, I'm back from my journey. And That's in that still case, in the movies. Yeah, it is. And in that sense, it's there and back again. That's not the same Hobbit whole, which is the only complaint I had about the movie was that they didn't have Sam get back in first, so it wasn't a perfect mirroring, but right. cramming some of that stuff in and making people wonder was that. But as far as books being able to tie things off, it very much was a fulfilling and for a lot of people who've followed Lord of the Rings for a long time, probably very emotional finale as well. Yeah, I mean, the just the fact that the ending takes out so many things and kind of sprinkles hints of it just to have it have a fulfilling con conclusion without this long, drawn-out battle of the Shire and stuff like that with Saruman, the fact that it was so drastically changed and people still love the mo way the movies end, hmm. like some... I've even heard some people talk about long endings of movies and talk about the Return of the King movie ending without even realizing that the book ending is somehow even longer. Like, yeah. the fact that the movies changed that aspect and st still people consider these movies the, like, some of the greatest, if not the greatest adaptations of any any fantasy novels or novels in general just mm. really really good adaptations and that just kind of shows that to make a good adaptation you don't necessarily need to stay 100 percent to the source material that is in many ways like it stays yeah. very close you don't have to, to be that. a purist as far as that goes and the example i like to think of as far as for poor adaptation or at least less positively received would be the ralph bakshi or ralph bakshi uh, Return of the King movie that came out, which was essentially closing off his Lord of the Rings animated series that came out in the 70s, which I believe started with The Hobbit. And that movie had rushed pacing, was like kind of confusing. There was this Return of the King where it wasn't quite clear exactly who the character of Aragorn or Strider was, and it was almost like it was a movie made for people who had already read the books. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, you had to kind of see what the very first opening parts were for each of them. Whereas a lot of people will say when you look at the new Lord of the Rings movies and the way that even those same books themselves were set up, they each began kind of in their own separate narrative and did a good enough job of working it, especially with the way that Return of the King began, essentially, was it picked up exactly where everything left off from Frodo being taken alive by the enemy except from the perspective of the, uh, I believe, the orcs who had taken him alive, or I believe it was actually goblins, if I remember correctly. And that was one of those interesting areas of it did all of that, but then you got to see these orcs talking to each other and giving each other expositional <laughs> information mm -hmm. in the first part of the book. So you can see in terms of movie books and how all those things work together, there's always going to be some aspect of some person who may be new or having to get a reminder of it. And I think that looking back at how other movies have done some of those in the same, you really need to kind of still look at each of those three, even though it's a trilogy. Each one of those, I think, has their own separate beginning and end and themes. The only thing that differentiates, I think, between each of them is, in fact, the second one ends on a dramatic cliffhanger. The first one ends with Frodo and Sam leaving the rest of the party. 
after the death of Boromir, but it still has a bit of a finality in terms of what the outcome was. So that's where I think the question I can pose to you is, is it better to look at more of these to be continued or more of these grab you and pull you on the edge of your seat type of cliffhangers? Or do you think that a lot of the structure is better off done from beginning to end as far as each of these different chapters may be considered? So is the question whether or not I preferred the cliffhanger or like, just beginning to end. Yeah, it's more of when you're going to be reading, are you going to be driven to read to the next book, even if there isn't something like a cliffhanger or something trying to push people to continue to read? Yeah, I'd say so. Even if there's a... um, Oftentimes when I've read book series, usually they've ended on cliffhangers, which I'm, I'm honestly okay with both, if I'm honest. But... Having a cliffhanger definitely makes me immediately want to read the next one mm. just because I like to have my end ending. Mm, yes. And an example of that would be um, the Emanesca series, which is a book series that I read uh, early last year and basically spent the entire year reading through. Mm-hmm. And there were four books and... After reading the first one and the cliffhanger ending that it had, I was like, well, I have to read. I, I'm, I'm in it till the end now. <laughs> I, I just have to read them all now. Mm-hmm. And after reading the last book, which kind of ended, but also led into a sequel trilogy. Okay, yeah. What's a little bit as far as just the basic premise for how you might compare that to Tolkien or some of the other fantasy for those not familiar? I don't know. Like myself, for example. It's... um. <laughs> The Emanesca series is, um, it's hard to explain. It's dark fantasy. Okay. Um, bordering on grimdark. I'm not sure if I would quite call it grimdark. It might be in that realm, though. Mm. Um, is, there's, the first book starts with a very simplistic premise of there's a stolen spell book, Mm -hmm. and the main character, Farden, has to go find it, Mm -hmm. and... Then, once you reach the end, the world kind of just expands into ah, this gotcha. much more complex plot. Mm-hmm. And then, in the fourth book, when it ends, you uh, get a conclusive ending to Farden's character arc. Mm-hmm. But there are a lot of plot lines that lead into that are left hanging, mm-hmm. leading yeah. into a sequel trilogy, which Ben Galley, the author is writing right now, which is mm. called The Scallison Chronicles. Mm. He just released late last year the first book, which I'm reading right now, mm-hmm. because I'm like, well, there's there's an ending to this arc, which was very satisfying, but everything else is still hanging in the balance, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm just gonna have to keep reading then. Yeah. And that's kind of some of the aspects of world building of um, the way I think of it is you look at how a movie can work, whereas movie series, where most of a movie, the idea is that you, or I guess you can even say there's other television shows where you don't know if it's going to get a season two or not. Right. Where sometimes you'll see where there's kind of the sequel hook is kind of the trope that's used. And what I think is interesting is Tolkien never had a sequel hook in The Hobbit at all. The no. only times that you saw a sequel hook, which obviously was for the trilogy that was started And then after that, he seemed to continue to build the world, but there weren't really any more stories that he told that were about future events of Middle-earth for that. And a lot of it, I think he sums up that the age of the elves ended, the age of men. So the idea of kind of almost the death of magic, the loss of um, kind of the, the arcane or other things that were more unknowable. He even talks as far as about how in the first book in The Hobbit, you may not see a hobbit because they're so quick and small and hide in their little holes that people don't know that they're existing. And obviously that changes over time with how he expands the world. But it does seem like the finality that happens in that regard is not really leaving itself up to much sequel hooks. And you look at no. the appendices, as soon as Legolas and Gimli kind of head out and Aragorn you know, ends up having his reign die and he passes away, you don't really have much expansion. What he does instead is goes back into more of the kind of magician's nephew for a C.S. Lewis book and expands the creation of the world and a lot of the areas of how it came to be and the different events that led up to it. So it's less even of a prequel series and more of like he kind of took the entirety of here's the world that I've created for that when he knew in his head what are some of the different steps that people went through 
that got them to this perspective. An easy example is they're singing a song in Elvish about a elf who fell in love with a human, which is one of the stories that was there that reflects and mirrors the Aragorn, Arwen, will they, won't they type of romance. Hmm. And so in that case, it's almost like, oh, hey, we'd be looking at two people like, so you guys met yesterday and you're already saying you love each other. What are you going to be, Romeo and Juliet and start like, you know, run off to get married and then kill yourselves over like meeting for coffee for 20 minutes? It's one of those type of aspects that it kind of uh, cements itself uh, in your brain as far as how our culture and how things are viewed kind of tells a truth. Tolkien came up with other th ways that he was able to tell those truths, but kind of stuck it into his world. And I think it's interesting that he probably didn't feel like he could expand his world or universe anymore. He told the story that he wanted to tell and kind of left it at that and still spent more time going over the world of the other aspects, but we never saw the depth of character or sort of journey uh, that we saw once it got to the fourth age, which so maybe that's for someone else to write, but there's a lot of differences in fantasy authors as far as sequel series and other aspects uh, sometimes it just feels like that there's every single thing that ends has to get a sequel has to get a spin-off and that's where some questions you have about some of the biggest properties out to today most people look at as far as um epic storytelling as just the disney properties of marvel or even warner brothers and harry potter there's so many movies that people have to get more money from and they kind of then push some of these authors in to keep writing yeah and that's kind of then the question of the sequel fatigue is it better to be able to continue to explore go into a world or have someone look at it through different eyes or is it better to kind of take something as it is and leave it well enough alone and what i think most people believe is as long as the work is quality they don't care that much about furthering expansions which right. you know it's talking 50 years later you look at that three books came out a lot of people went through and read christopher tolkien's work but I don't think there was any um, type of spinoff that people were looking for anticipating up until Amazon decided to do something. <laughs> right. And even a good example, like, in in films, it with things getting a conclusive ending and then people starting to warm up to the idea of if a sequel is quality, we can still enjoy this, mm -hmm. is with the Toy Story movies. Oh, yeah. The... Um, Toy Story 3 ends in a very conclusive way, mm -hmm. in a very satisfying satisfying ending. And then Toy Story 4 was announced, and everyone was like, why are we having another Toy Story? There's there's an ending. And I don't know what your opinion of Toy Story 4 is, but after watching it, I was like, this is... I loved Toy Story 4, in my opinion. It did a good job of keeping the quality of like the other films, while also not butchering the ending of the third film if that makes sense like you mm -hmm. can and it really does cement the idea that i think it depends on the person writing the story the person telling the story mm -hmm. if they are able to keep up the quality and keep going then i'm fine with that mm -hmm. but if they simply acknowledge that they can't then i think it's okay to have a conclusive ending like tolkien did with the lord of the rings because mm -hmm. i do believe he did try at one point to write a story that took place in a later age after the Lord of the Rings, but he mm -hmm. it just never got off the ground. Yeah, and that's where the whole aspect that was interesting, if you think about how a lot of it began, was telling a kid a bedtime story for that one, and then it's like, well, what happened at least to that ring someday? Did he keep it forever? And then it's like, well, I mean, how was the ring magic? Where did it come from? A lot of those questions opened up, and it seems like he answered all of those different questions. I think a lot of times that's really what fiction writing comes down to in a lot of ways can be um, just asking a question and then people looking and searching for answers. Authors and really probably any type of writer is always someone who has something to say and they'll usually say something whether it's through characters, whether it's through metaphors or themes um, or other motifs and then usually you always have to walk away with a certain type of feeling. And I think it tells a lot about the way that that author views not just like their world, but their life. Tolkien really took the idea of all of these fantastical, almost childlike type of creations and creatures, like the type of careful or the hobgoblin will jump out from under your bed and turned it into an entire epic and wartime <laughs> type of story that really was ultimately about small people can change the course of the future. You're like, oh yeah, Hobbit's smaller than everyone. Idea of how a king kind of rose from the unlikeliest of places who overcame a lot of fear. And then you look at how 
Even the friendship of Legolas and Gimli, two races who hate each other, were able to come together. Mm -hmm. It was a very positive, conclusive ending. I don't think every story has to be that way in a regard. There's some authors who take a look at that and will essentially say, well, that's very unrealistic. <laughs> right, right. So, like a good example is uh, they tried, I think it was the net most, uh, well, film wasn't as well reviewed, but Netflix tried to do a version of Bright, which is essentially a modern day Lord of the Rings where you've got people who are like fantastic creatures or orcs almost who are like joining the police force. And they're like, okay, well, that's a unique thing. Most of the things that people look at is, is this a metaphor that's being made about ideas either of race or culture or other aspects and I think that's where people's view changes. Tolkien really never had that type of view, in my belief, as far as for looking at it when it came to those things. His races were all separate, and part of that is not because he, I think, believes so much in trying to segregate, mm. but more because I think that he just had a simple story to tell. He had good and evil. Good was very clear. Evil was very clear. Good beats evil. A lot of fantasy writing today, I think, takes a lot of those things and tries to catapult with... What ifs and the easiest one that most people recognize is how Game of Thrones is the anti-Tolkien in a sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which, when you look at how, you know, I think the author himself said, Gandalf just came back, like there was nothing sacrificed or given, and I think that made a lot of Tolkien fans mad, because the idea of Tolkien being able to see one character who was the Grey overcoming some sort of um, issue, growing from it and becoming greater as a result, was a theme constant throughout his work. Whereas Martin essentially has something that people give up and almost seem to get worse or devolve more as they interact with other people or society. Mm -hmm. And his version of writing is almost like serialized. Every single chapter ends with some sort of twist. Like, and he opens up the door and suddenly Dragonfire blasts. End of this chapter, you find out what happens in the next chapter. It's like everything has to drive you. And it's different from Lord of the Rings. In Lord of the Rings, everything kind of finishes conclusively. Thrones tries to keep pushing you through so you have to know how it ends, but... When you're looking at how that goes, not just from the adaptation, but the, the fact of what most of the books and things say, there's a certain lack of finality that pops up all throughout it, where it almost feels like when Tolkien finished his story and there was something satisfying and concluding, you could kind of be able to go back to that repeatedly versus having to be constantly hanging on the next word. So I think that's kind of the question I'll ask you, Cameron, is how much of fiction writing should be almost in this like marketable see realize like you know you've got to hang on every single word versus right. being able to try to build a story welcome people in and kind of have more of maybe that cozy hobbit hole and maybe that does include ending how return of the king ended with this long drawn out ending what are some of your thoughts on do you think one approach is right or wrong or is that more of something that depends on the work that the author's writing yeah i think it really does depend on the author because i think it's okay to have both a Martin and a Tolkien simply because when an author starts to write, they usually have a point in mind. And even if they don't, as they start to write, it just kind of happens that you mm -hmm. like start to get a point. And Tolkien and Martin have very different themes that they are trying to flesh out. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think there's a definitive answer to you we need to only have Tolkien style writing or we need to only have Martin style writing like those sure. are two extremes of either side of that I think if it kind of goes back to the talk of a cliffhanger or a conclusive ending it really depends on the author and if they're capable of writing a story similarly to Martin where it's more about the corruption of humanity no. versus yeah. Tolkien, then they can write about that. Right. I was going to say, Tolkien's entire work is, is something, at least, that points always to humans, which is even the you know the theme of the movie. It is in men we place our, place our trust, is one of the quotes, and says, well, men are weak. Look at what happened here. And so it's the idea of being able to grow and continue to improve. That's some of the worldview Tolkien had. Martin, on the other hand, looked at everything Tolkien said and saw something false in that, to the point where he even has the entire... Um, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die moment that the Princess Bride kind of made this overcoming adversity, being able to finally seek revenge, being able to find justice, and subverted that by having the person who someone was trying to get revenge on killed them instead in this brutal and graphic way. And it was 
completely unexpected from people <laughs> that were like, oh, wow, we thought he was going to overcome because that's how it normally goes. And it was trying to show that really he was like, hey, strongest man in this case won. And not every time you're going to be able to see because there isn't always going to be perfect revenge or justice into the world. And that was the point I think that he was trying to make was almost pushing back against some of those fantasy tropes in terms of trying to look at people in what some would call maybe a realistic sense. But you could also say it's probably from more of like a maybe not glass half empty approach like glass is half empty and it's leaking in George R. R. Martin's world. Right, right. Everyone, even the people who try to be like the most good end up doing terrible and awful and selfish things. And that, I think, makes a great statement as far as looking for character in other aspects, like the way that their world is put together and other things, even how it deals with stuff such as prophecies, which, you know, prophecy in a lot of ways turns into, um, in some cases, just as a writing tool, almost like a Chekhov's gun, where you mention a prophecy. Well, what happens if the prophecy doesn't come true? Well, then either something was wrong <laughs> about the prophecy. Well, how then does that factor in if you got false prophecy or not? Why Why did you put this in in the first place? Mm -hmm. Whereas most places that do have some sort of prophecy, it turns into some sort of foreshadowing for the adventure that's going to occur. It's become a trope. Prophecy has become a trope. Oh, yeah. The funniest one I think about all of those is the, the, uh, the epic fantasy Lego movie, which had a prophecy that was there that was made up. Oh, by yeah. And in that regard, it was the idea, at least, of how we still had that expectation. The entire movie's plot hinges on that prophecy. And then the prophecy is revealed, oh, sorry, I made it up. It's not true. It ultimately came true into the end. And part of the movie was... Uh, about making choices ultimately versus being dictated by fate, which is more of a worldview. You can have some people are ultimately try to argue or have works of fiction similar to, um, I think there was Greek, Greek fantasy had one of these ones with, um, oh, Oedipus Rex uh, receives a prophecy at least. Prophecy still comes true even though he tries to fight it. So that was a definitely a different take on some of the world building. So when it comes to Tolkien and the way that he essentially had it, there was really not any type of prophecy that came down that said that Frodo and Sam were going to succeed. The only thing that we knew, at least, There's was the that Aragorn prophecy. The Aragorn prophecy of the return of the king coming to Gondor, essentially. Which is kind of... In This is another thing that's different with the movies and the films. They don't really mention the prophecy in the movies until, like, the third film. Mm -hmm. And then... And then he gets the the sword at in the third one. When Versus he, in the first book was when he got just the has sword it, gets it right away in a very non dramatic fashion. Just like oh hey he got this cool sword that was reforged cool and it's very differently handled as far as Aragorn's journey in in that regard. And, and I was gonna say I was gonna ask you the third book especially also featured Denethor, which we got kind of this almost trifecta of the. The family, at least, of the steward of Gondor. You start off with Boromir, who's almost this nationalistic, very, like, hyper-Gondor-focused, we're-on-the-front-lines, militaristic type of standard, mm -hmm. who ends up being kind of seduced and corrupted by, ultimately, power Faramir, who then, I think, rejects that power. And then you see the source of all that with Denethor. What did you think about Denethor's inclusion, especially the factor that he was almost an antagonist to Aragorn and the returning of the king, despite the fact that his entire job was to hold the throne until he came back. Was that kind of one of those Tolkien maybe twisting things a little bit or making maybe a statement about people who are kind of given in places of power who are don't really deserve it? Or is that more of just a little bit of dramatic action that tried to explain character what's some of denethor and part of how his journey starts and begins because he's probably in a lot of ways the most interesting new character that shows up in the return of the king because yeah. everything that you kind of learn or reveal about him ends up being a huge surprise for the most part from what people expected yeah the end the end of his character in the the movies again is very different from his end in the books yes and i I don't know if this was Tolkien's intent, but this is now thinking back on it, what has stuck with me. The reason he starts to go crazy is because he's been looking into the Palantir. Yes. And he 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 just sees, um, doesn't he see a glimpse of Mordor and what's coming? And he just freaks out. He basically just gives up and is like, there's no point in resisting, there's no point in anything, why even bother fighting? And there is still there is still that in the movies. Not not to the extent 
that the books are, but there's an extended scene in The Return of the King where he's taking Faramir uh, to the tombs to be burned and to burn along with him. And he says, why do the why do the people flee? Why do they run? Why don't they just right. accept that they're going to die? And I think it's a way of Tolkien almost addressing this idea of what's even the point of anything if we're like all going to die, we might as well just end it all now. Like, I'm not sure if that was Tolkien's intent, but I found that that was constantly what was going through my head of like mm -hmm. these opinions clashing of all these other main characters who are like, we have to fight, we have to save Minas Tirith from, from Mordor, they're attacking right now, mm -hmm. and Denethor's like, why bother? What's even right. the point? Yeah, and what I think is interesting is, and this is kind of where a lot of people talk about how art can reflect life. The book was published in about 1955, and it's, it's very easy to look back at different types. Even movies are the easiest way to do it, but look at when a movie comes out in a year as far as what influences the writing. The easiest one I can think of is in 2016, we got Batman versus Superman. And that was when there was a very controversial U.S. presidential election. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and when you look at how a lot of art reflecting life and other aspects, like the Lord of the Rings series came out from 2000 to 2003, coming out of the 1990s period. And that was where it was filmed before. And what was interesting is, um, I believe, if I remember correctly, the movies were finished in, I'll have to look up exactly the year, but Tolkien finished Return of the King and it was published in 1955. And what's curious is it seems very much like he probably knew where he was going to have the story go as far as with Frodo and the ring, but to move into the realm of Denethor and to make the choice that Denethor doesn't just step aside, welcome Aragorn, he doesn't just simply be able to recognize the boon, he almost views it as a threat to his rule, a threat to his power, and when he embraces this fatalistic, almost end-of-the-world type thing, it makes me wonder, was there any type of nuclear fear other stuff that maybe had articles about different nuclear testing mm. facilities about how there was spread obviously of communism and other places the post-world war ii era was one of unprecedented success and peace with a lot of nuclear tension that happened at least as far as you know the, the space race dominated the next few years after that and tolkien uh essentially was living right in the midst of a lot of that where you're in britain rebuilding after a broken world war ii very similar, honestly, to that rebuilding after the bombing of London and other aspects that we get to see. So I wonder if there's elements of just looking in the newspaper or reading or seeing people who are paralyzed over fear or some sort of we're all going to die in a nuclear explosion or all of these other aspects that were moved on. Right. Were there aspects of that that he was almost then pushing back against those people and still finding some sort of common well, faith? And yeah. I think that's the easy mark you can make is you show the contrast between... Denethor's ending and someone like Gandalf and the fact that Gandalf in the movie they even make it as blatant as he essentially takes over command of the battle to inspire provide hope and be able even when hope seems lost and ultimately their efforts were rewarded that's a very very strong statement to make versus um any type of all right it doesn't matter what they all did in the end because turns out Sauron was just working for Morgoth the whole time and Morgoth went and took everything over right it's a very very different uh ending of that regard and it's it's interesting to me to think about some of those things that we don't have a good glimpse into in our culture speaking of the battle the 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 battle at Minas Tirith specifically I made a statement in the last episode mm -hmm. that I loved the way Tolkien wrote the Battle of Helm's Deep. Mm -hmm. But I prefer the Battle at Minas Tirith more. Hmm. It is, right now, one of my favorite battles in all of fantasy. Mm -hmm. I absolutely love the way he wrote it. It's just like stuck in my mind. And again, this is a battle that's... There are portions of it that are pretty different from the movie. In the mm -hmm. movie, Aragorn comes in with an army of ghost people. Oh, yeah. Whereas in the book, the ghosts only help them take down the ships. And then what is it? He comes back with all of the rangers. Yeah, it's the rangers for that and then the other wild men, I think. No, they, they beat the wild men, I think, that were on the ships. But yeah, yeah it was essentially the Just arrival. Rangers and the Dunedain. Yeah. And there is at least the foreshadowing, the kind of move for all that that I thought was interesting was, um, and this is even kind of the aspect that came in some of the Ralph Bakshi movie, Return of the King, 
was Gandalf impressing onto Aragorn, it's time for you to step up as, in your duties as a king and lead. And so it seems that Aragorn was the one then who went and gathered all of this men and were basically having to then coordinate to essentially outthink the enemy and outflank the attack. And what I thought was interesting with the perspective that we see in some of the Booker movie, it's almost like that Sauron is daring Aragorn to actually step up and assume his mantle, assuming that he will not, he'll be too afraid or too cowardly and won't be able to do it. And so then it turns into underestimates his opponent. He thought he had outmaneuvered his opponent. Then whatever Sauron had brought to turn the tides had actually been used as a piece against him. I think it does a great job of being able to set up the... Every single type of villain always has to have some sort of fatal flaw that goes along. Like heroes right. who have a fatal flaw are always a tragic hero. And every single type of, you know, whether it's fictional world or even especially fantasy world, there's always a fatal flaw that you see, which is, you know, it, it kind of makes sense in a lot of ways. Of There's this uh, powerful villain, at least, who's there. Turns out that using this one magic word is able to make their castle crumble around them. Or being able to find that uh, there's some sort of life-giving um, spell that they're able to concoct. Well, there's either a counter spell or a... Uh, Obvious example, Harry Potter used these different physical objects to destroy that essentially then destroyed the bad guy. <laughs> and in this regard, the thing that outdid uh, Sauron was he essentially underestimated Aragorn, and he also essentially underestimated the work of the two hobbits. He believed himself to be above the likes of men and yep. above the likes of hobbits, and his fatal flaw then ultimately was, was pride. And that's, I think, a fantastic twist that you get to see, at least, as far as Aragorn's strength as far as the counterpoint is him stepping up stepping it's... up and so it's the opposite of pride it's not this humility even it's kind of this fear or this inability stuff so i think when you're looking about for fiction and seeing how you're able to write you always want to be able to have some form of counterpart that you're able to see kind of in your main hero's journey and then even in the main villain's journey for the most part and that makes me think that aragorn even more sometimes than frodo or sam is probably the bigger hero in Return of the King, which is why mm -hmm. he gets his name on the title. That's... <laughs> Return of the King is Aragorn. And I mean, the ending, that's what I love so much, is that you kind of learn that Aragorn almost goaded Sauron into attacking Minas Tirith. He like, oh, yeah. didn't he look into the Palantir and like, almost like, said, hey, I'm heading, heading to Gondor, like, yeah. basically challenging him knowing that Sauron was going to come. Yeah, and that did happen in the uh, extended version as well, too, where they've got the Palantir that's there, and I believe he does look look into it, or at least there's some aspect In the film, there. it's used afterwards, Correct. when they head to Mordor. Yep, when they're, they kind of, so they brought some of those pieces in, um, which, and that was also, I did take a look up, at least, as far as the time period. So after The Hobbit came out in 1937, Lord of the Rings was written between 1937 and 1949. Mm. So, The Lord of the Rings is a series that then finished with The Return of the King being done after World War II was done. So, now you think about Lord of the Rings through the setting of a guy who lived through World War I and is living through World War II, and you get to see kind of this idea of these terrible atrocities and everything overcome and the fallout that's after it. It kind of gives a different perspective on what The Return of the King being... Essentially, in a lot of ways, it's almost like you could say the downfall of the Japanese Empire, of the, the Third Reich, of how Britain was essentially the last country standing. And <laughs> someone even said it was really funny that um, you could even point to is when you talk about the eagles arriving in the last minute to save the men from disaster, you know. I'm not telling you that it's exactly what Tolkien had in mind, but the national bird of the United States is an eagle. Mm. <laughs> so when you're talking about the United States Army entering the war at the last thing, look, the eagles, the eagles are here. It's like, <laughs> oh my goodness, this is almost like he's taking the experiences he's living through and pouring them into this fantasy world in a lot of ways. So right. I think that's one of the aspects of not to say you have to write life exactly how it is, but... It just shows a lot of the inspiration, and I think a lot of why we call it the greatest generation is because there was an aspect of belief that people had that did overcome a lot of terror, and that's why I think a lot of people look back on World War II as the prime example for there's always a World War II movie, it seems like, every year, and it's a huge part of culture because a lot of that narrative of stepping up, overcoming, working together for a common goal, all those things are things that we kind of like as humans and we got to see all of them happen on a worldwide stage similar to how the lord of the rings was from everywhere from rohan to gondor to the elves even uh joining at least in battle for i believe it was like the last alliance of men and elves or something mm -hmm. that another last alliance that popped up it was just in a it wasn't quite as dramatic and over the top as they had it in the two towers film <laughs> right right 
So in overall, for me anyway, as someone who just recently finished the Lord of the Rings all the way through for the very first time, and it's still being very fresh in my head, Mm -hmm. Return of the King is definitely the one that has stuck with me the most. And it's definitely the one I've been thinking about more. Maybe that's just because it's the one that I, I listened to it on audiobook. That is the one that I listened to last, Mm -hmm. but I don't know. There's just, I love all of the, the story beats with Frodo and Sam and the battle of Minas Tirith is Mm -hmm. fantastic in my opinion. And I love, love the unique ending with the battle of the Shire against Saruman and the way everything Mm -hmm. wrapped up. And so I will, I will say for, for now at least, that Return of the King is definitely my favorite of the three. Yeah, and I like the way that Return of the King ends on the... I think part of the reason why people, like you said, like it shows the character growth and development. The reason why I think that people felt like it was a bit different is the height and the stakes of this entire world and all of like the fate of the... Like, maybe almost like... Maybe not fate of the universe, but fate of Middle-earth as you knew it, came down to essentially two hobbits, one former, who were both essentially addicted to the ring fighting each other back and forth on the cliff over a volcano for essentially, like, the fate of how the world was going to turn out. So it's taking all those little battles, turning it into a small battle, and then even the fact that Frodo turned uh, against and essentially gave in and succumbed to that idea of power, I think that's part of what shows a bit about humanity as well. And so there's a bit of luck a little bit that plays, for the most part, with Gollum falling in, showing how Sam was able to be kind of that pure-of-heart person who... Got them all the way there. I think that was part of where you can't really get higher stakes or so than fighting as far as for a fist fight over a volcano. <laughs> it's right. almost like one of those cases where we like to see like these giant battles, but ultimately I think it talks to the battle that people can have it each and every day of conflict of where you want two separate and different things. And I think that it's an interesting kind of, maybe not final statement, but at least in the War of the Ring of how the two things I think that I took out of Return of the King was how the biggest types of kind of battles at least that we fight every day are usually just the small little individual ones like Frodo and Gollum Mm -hmm. and the effect that we have and that we see from a lot of those aspects and the scourging of the Shire I think shows a lot as far as with how suffering in other places can be universal and it I think made a statement about being able to end some of that suffering is because you had to have people who went through and experienced it grew from it as a result Mm mm-hmm So both of those, I think, are great ways where if you are writing a book for kids today, those are themes that maybe you don't have to have the same type of aspect of war, but those are two really strong statements and sentiments that I think you come out of that almost feels like it's empowering as a result. Like, you don't leave the Return of the King feeling drained as you probably would as far as unless you know unless you don't like four and a half hour long movies or find them draining right, you almost right. feel like you're empowered like hey look at this little hobbit he did all these other different things like that one you almost feel like you can as well and that's i think the lasting impact of why return of the king i think leaves you on just such a different um platform than the two towers does or even the fellowship of the ring does mm-hmm. and i love it i love it for it'll be a while probably before i read them again mm-hmm just because I want to let it sit for a little bit, but I definitely can see myself going and reading these for like on a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. That's what my brother does. And me going to him and being like, Cole, you won't believe what just happened. He's like, yeah, yeah. How's that? And it was just one of the best experiences I've had with reading fantasy in Mm -hmm. a long time. All right, so do you want to talk about the uh, the Amanaska yeah, books? go for it. Talk a little bit about, because you talk about how it's dark fantasy, and with the idea of what dark fantasy is and how that differs from Tolkien is more of like the epic fantasy as far as good, evil, a lot of the different big stakes, a lot of the size of scale. That's kind of the epic fantasy, and some of it's easy, like, oh, hey, look, it's a dwarf for that one. Dwarves dwell and do mining in caves. Elves fly freely in the... It very much kind of sticks to more of those very defined tropes for the most part and then kind of plays with them as far as the characters how then would this as a dark fantasy series differ from lord of the rings and what is kind of the quality that you see in in that work well so in my last two episodes i talked about the first two books of this series which Mm -hmm. is the written and pale kings and 
this episode, I wanted to talk. The last two books are Dead Stars Part 1 and Dead Stars Part 2. Mm-hmm. It was originally planned as one book, and then the author just split it into two yeah. with fairly conclusive arcs, but I've always I preferred to see them as more as one. It's kind of a blend between Tolkien and Martin in a way where it there are definitely shows the the hope of humanity as it does kind of in Tolkien's work Mm -hmm. but also shows the corruption of humanity as Mm -hmm. well a big theme that starts to show its face in Pale Kings and I don't want to get too heavy into spoilers um but I I will when I have if I have to um is that every action has consequences Mm -hmm. both positive actions and negative actions both have a reaction sure. of sorts and Farden as a character is at his lowest point at mm-hmm. the start of the third book and the third and fourth book is basically his redemption arc throughout the first two books there is this drug that he's addicted to called Nevermare mm-hmm. and he is a written which is basically he has um, runes uh, tattooed onto his back. Mm-hmm. Normally, when you cast spells in this world, you either have to say it through words or use trinkets of a sort to cast it. But because yeah. he has this spell book imprinted on his back, he can just use it like he's flexing a muscle. Mm-hmm. And Nevermare is a drug that basically is poison to magic. So when he smokes it he can't use magic for a while Mm -hmm. and with the way that pale kings ends he goes so becomes so low Mm -hmm. and just kind of leaves everything behind and becomes addicted to nevermare like he never had before Mm -hmm. and he can't use his magic for most of these two books simply because it's been like I want to say an eight year time skip between the second and third book. Mm. And that whole time he's just been taking Nevermare. And he, because of that decision, he, uh, he has to live with that because he's taken, he's thrust back into this, this life that he tried to leave behind, realizes the wrongs of his mistakes. Mm -hmm. And, tries to be better and it's hard for him to be better because he he doesn't have his magic anymore that was like his defining feature Mm -hmm. and because he made this choice of screw everyone he has to live with yeah he's to live with the consequences and that's one thing i think that's interesting of the why george r R. martin's whole entire game of thrones series came about he said was because when gandalf was apparently killed off in fellowship of the ring he was like, oh, that broke, like, the rule. Like, why did they... You don't just kill off the wizard with everything. And so when he thought, now someone can die at any time, potentially. And then, of course, when he comes back, you end up seeing more of the story that was going to be told and other aspects of that, where he was like, oh, Gandalf came back. Psh, that's dumb. There was nothing. This death was meaningless. And that is a little bit different as far as regular Tolkien lore. But to a person reading it, I can understand how it may come across as cheap because, it was like you said, actions that you have do ultimately have consequences in the real world. Right. And the, you know, like, there's a lot of stuff someone even said, I think, is if you took all the money that the Marvel movies have ever made, like how much they've grossed, it still would not pay for as much as what would happen from the damages their heroes caused in real life. Like, you're talking about cities being leveled to the ground, you're talking about all these different lives that were there. That's one of those cases that I think ends up being kind of, you know, some people like and can operate in that world, other people... I think do prefer some of that rule of cool where you're, you know, able to talk about how, you know, the elf and the dwarf are basically just galloping on a horse, chopping people down with axes. There's a little bit of a glamour that comes to it, but having a darker type of world that deals with some of those consequences, um, I, I think it always goes back to that idea of being able to have rules that are set up and then recognizing that creativity comes not from breaking those rules, but from being kind of constrained by them. So an easy example is, like, you can't really use the eagles for all that. Why are you not able to use the eagles? Well, they're technically another mythical race that you have, for the most part, who don't intervene under, like, almost any circumstances, for the most part. That's, like, one of those rules that's set 
So some people are like, well, Tolkien wrote himself into a corner. Might as well the Eagles come out. Versus the Eagles being, if you look at it as a reflection of the United States entering the war, what happened in the United States? Oh, we're definitely passive-aggressive. We're not doing anything. And then something personal happens, and suddenly they jump into that. It very much, at least, is that, I think mimics that... Um, uh, let me go with this. It mimics that sense of, as a writer, being able to recognize that um, writing and other aspects that you have is much, much more difficult when you've got more and more rules. If you're going to write an entire fantasy novel that takes place just in the space of a room, one single room, that is such a huge level of constrainment that if you're going to try to write a story about, okay, well, what happens in this room? What happens in this cage? What's the person who's there? Suddenly it forces you to have to adapt or think, okay, how do I get a fantasy genre inside of a room? Suddenly maybe you could look at, okay, well, what's going to be, is there some sort of thing that traps a person in a box? Is there some sort of fantastical race that they're here? And you may come up with the idea of a group of people who sealed themselves away from every single other person because they believe that that would that other people caused other people to either have some sort of sin or conflict or falling, so clearly sealing themselves away from other people was the only way to kind of purify. Right. All of a sudden, you're like, wow, that's kind of interesting for each of those different aspects. Then you wonder, what's the world going to look like if they come out of that box? So putting different constraints and different rules in place. Like, and Tolkien was very much, like, he did not mix his mythology <laughs> whatsoever. Like, there was no minotaur that you were going to really be able to see. He understood, here's where each of the different creatures came from here's the history of all of them there's not going to be any type of you know suddenly all you know you find a halfling that has wings or something like that right right so when it comes to each of those things when you're talking about oh universal roles have consequences and drug aspects or other things i think that that's a fascinating type of constriction that you can put on of knowing and i think it builds tension of he doesn't have the magic to rely on suddenly you have to look at this character to grow in a brand new aspect and i think right. that uh, that's one of the things that makes good fiction writing. There is another portion portion of this storyline that is based, again, on Farden's actions. Um, there is a prophecy in these books, but it almost it's not a prophecy of someone saving the world. Mm -hmm. It's a prophecy of someone destroying it. Mm. There, um, There's something in these books that really comes more to the forefront in the beginning of the second book mm -hmm. is called the dust song which is there is just this like pure being who will come and basically main make demons rain from the sky and it is revealed Fardin makes a mistake at the end of the first book um sleeps with someone and she becomes pregnant mm -hmm. and written are not supposed to um reproduce and it is mm. revealed that this child, his daughter, is the prophecy fulfilled. She is basically, the, for a lot of it, is one of the key antagonists of the third and fourth books. I was going to say, it sounds kind of like she's an apocalypse maiden, which a lot yep. of times happen because what I love about the apocalypse maiden as a trope is it takes what's the most innocent thing that you can think of as far as a creature while well, outside of a puppy or like a kitten, it'd be like a little girl because, you know, little boys are still rough and tumble, whereas little girls, at least there's some sort of sense of purity or innocence almost to them, which we can kind of see some of that in Tolkien and how he wrote women, he wrote his women as full grown and strong there's never really any type of smaller female children that we really even see in his books and that was kind of interesting tying in so seeing an apocalypse maiden that's already kind of almost like a little bit of almost like the horror genre of like you know you you have the some of the scariest movies alive or ones of a, a demon baby or something like that turns into an antagonist that's something that is ultimately primal goes against what we know i think is humans and so that is kind of scary that you have a mistake that's made turns into this terrifying thing yeah i mean i think this is something that i've gone back and forth on like we talked about cliffhangers and uh conclusive endings i will say when you end a fantasy series like it's the last book in the series mm -hmm. i do think now's the time to have this the the payoff and the satisfying ending you know mm -hmm. yeah um and the key aspects of this story are Samara, which is Farden's daughter, mm -hmm. and Farden's redemption arc. Him not only trying to deal with who he was at the start of the books, but also 
the at the beginning of the books, he has these van braces that they don't really go into a lot of detail of. Mm-hmm. Um, they just explain that it makes him stronger, um, and it keeps him young. Mm-hmm. And it's revealed that they are part of these not part of this set of armor called the Scalison armor, mm-hmm. which he has been hunting throughout the entire series mm-hmm. to try and not it's basically keep himself immortal. Yeah. And the last two books is him saying I it takes this subplot and makes it a part of the main plot mm-hmm. of his redemption arc of if I find the skeleton armor, I can maybe get my magic back mm-hmm. and I can try and fix my mistakes. Mm-hmm. And that is that story arc is very much ended. Mm-hmm. It's conclusive. And that's probably my favorite part of the end mm-hmm. of these books is Fardin's arc gets a satisfying end mm-hmm. and his conflict with his daughter and all of that ends as well. Yeah. But there's nothing really else that has a conclusive ending. Yeah, so it seems like that there's areas that can spread out or go further and that's where I think a lot of the... Uh, with writing, and this is just some of, like, remembering back to the TV characters, everything in terms of movies is usually about, like, spectacle and the story, whereas television, a lot of it's about character. And when it comes to fiction writing, the question is, all right, usually the hero has an I want, and that's, like, how everyone's got something I want, and by the end of it, the conclusion of that hero's arc is usually, did they achieve and get what they want? Mm. If they got what they want, it's usually always a happy ending. If they did not get what they wanted, it's usually always going to be some sort of tragic ending. And that's where I think, and a lot like how you're talking about with how the series ends, by assembling and getting the armor together and saying, hey, can this get me my magic back? That can kind of determine, you know, the hero or tragic. And what's kind of funny is every single story you read, at least, there's always going to be some person, at least, who ends up having that tragic ending because they didn't get what they wanted. And someone even, I think, made the joke about how um, George R. R. Martin would always kill off his characters because they would always have something unresolved. Or you'd even make the joke of, like, hey, it's a police officer. Hey, guys, guess what? I'm just one day away from retirement, hoping that nothing bad happens, and then <laughs> he dies. <laughs> right. And you're like, oh, no, he was just about to retire, is like kind of the joke. But it's still the same type of thing, at least, of, like, you know, you're in the middle of a battle or something like that. Someone pulls a picture of that, like, who's that? Oh, it's my wife and daughter. I'm going to go back home to them soon. And then they just die, and as they fall down, like, you see the picture just hits the ground as their hand and the picture floats out of their hand Pull and a you full feel, metal alchemist yeah. well, you see, and you feel this sadness that comes down because the pe- person did not accomplish their goal and that's something i think as far as when it comes to being able to conclusively tie off a series is you always have whatever they set out and conclude is whatever was listed from the start sometimes it evolves and changes into something bigger but it always is like you know at the very end of return of the king frodo essentially sets off on this journey to destroy this ring. Um, Aragorn's got this journey to assemble and return to this kingship. Each character kind of accomplishes whatever their goal was for the most part. And in the same way that this other series that you have with getting the Scalise armor and, you know, without giving into the spoilers of whether or not he's able to achieve or attain it, his goal is kind of to be able to recognize of kind of paying for past mistakes because the mistake that he made of that daughter, the mistake he made of getting rid of his magic, he's trying to undergo some sort of sacrifice to be able to make amends and at the same time find this treasure that he's sought for afterwards, maybe not for the reason that it was intended, but to use it in a brand new way. So that's where when you get those types of arcs that can finish, that's kind of what I think can linger with people, even if you do start with a new character in a new place in the same world. And yeah. That's where I think what I love about um, being able to go into that writing mindset of being able to build worlds is um, people don't ultimately, I think, get attached to worlds. Like, you can have some people who are just love the world of Harry Potter that's been set up, but really you care ultimately about does Harry manage to get back at Voldemort at the very end, what goes on to the characters, who lives or who dies... It shows, I think, in a lot of ways that we can care a lot about worlds as far as for ideas. That's where the head, I think, works. But really, the heart is what makes people truly love that aspect. And that's what I think comes down to character, you know, the character motivation arcs, all of those other different types of things. Like, you know, if you said, hey, we got a John Wick movie without Keanu Reeves, you know who's going to watch that? (laughs) Because the movie's called John Wick. The world of assassins is really awesome and cool, but you... It's nothing without John Wick in it. Yeah, and you care ultimately about the person who's there. So that's the same thing, I think, with The Lord of the Rings and part of why I think you got to see 
you never saw another story that was came out of with Tolkien. He told the story about his characters he wanted to tell, but the world continued to grow and to grow and to grow in a lot of regards because he was not as much even emotion. <laughs> his emotions were attached to the world that was there he was creating. And I think it was a fantastic decision. And why, if you're going to move into a different aspect of the world, I think it's great, but are you going to be able to have that same type of character? And that's something I think I'll be curious about with the sequel series is, will that character consistency and what happens or what changes, or even if you meet an old character coming back into the fray, all of a sudden you're like, oh, cameo alert, mm -hmm. which happens a lot in some of those things. Is it going to have that same type of dramatic impact? Most of the time it does because you're emotionally attached to that character. For me personally, something I do want to point out is at the end of reading the last book, Dead Stars Part 2, it is stated by the author, his plan was always to write the Scalison Chronicles, the sequel sure. trilogy afterwards. So it's not like he just left it hanging for the sake of leaving a cliffhanger. Mm -hmm. He knows where it's going to go in some aspect. I don't know how much in-depth that is, mm -hmm. but originally after reading Dead Stars Part 2, it is still probably my least favorite of the four. I still really mm. like it. There are just some other aspects where I think it's a bit slow in parts, but I really love the third one. The fourth one I really like, mm -hmm. but I don't think I say I love it. Mm -hmm. But after reading, or in the process of reading the first book of the Skallison Chronicles, The Forever King, mm -hmm. which does leave an impact every time characters from the other series come in, sure. it has left a better taste in my mouth. Hmm. And... If the Skallison Chronicles ends in a conclusive way, I think I can look back at the way the Emanesca series ends and say, yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Again, he's yet to finish it, so we'll see. But the where where I'm at right now, where I can see it going, mm -hmm. I like where it's headed, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, and that's where a lot of that comes down to, not just where characters goes, but where the world is going to happen. That's part of why I think people love this idea of kind of continuing fiction or playing around in the same world. It's always usually just the conclusion has to, um, unfortunately, be kind of satisfying in the regards of being able to make a statement about life or something that's there that you're able to kind of learn from and whether you feel good about it or whether you feel uh, poorly about it or whether it's kind of a warning type of lesson, at least. Of um, Obviously, the easy example here is how um, the books... Of uh, the uh, Song of Ice and Fire, which is the Game of Thrones, is based off of those, versus how the TV series ended is two almost totally different things. One is just a, one that was so ill-received that people said, yeah, I don't even watch the entire series. It almost phased out of pop culture because mm -hmm. essentially said, hey, everything that people are working for, you're not going to kind of get what you want. And people went to more of this kind of content and didn't really change or learn that much from the series. That like There wasn't anything that was truly dramatic. Whereas in the actual book series, you can kind of see the entirety and idea, at least, is almost a warning of, hey, all these cold people, at least, are going to kill you all unless you band together and put aside your petty differences. Mm -hmm. That, and then if you turn it into, eh, it turns out everything's frozen now. That becomes a totally different warning that could even have modern consequences and showcases a lot of, you know, kind of the themes of the entire book, for the most part, would be ultimately one of looking past flaws and differences to unite against a common enemy that that has a whole lot of meaning that you can find in today's pretty divided world mm -hmm. and i think going from dead stars part two and going to the forever king i immediately was like okay i need this i need what you left hanging at the end of the Emanesca series to pay off i mm -hmm. need that sure. <laughs> otherwise i feel like this was all for nothing not mm -hmm. not all for nothing because the arc with the main character was very conclusive at the mm -hmm. end of the books. But already, even just when I first started The Forever King, mm -hmm. he immediately addresses, like, okay, this is what we're going to take care of this right now. And it sets up for new things, mm -hmm. which already makes me look back at these last two books in a much more positive light. Hmm. Like, okay, yeah. he knows he knows what his audience wants and to that, see. Maybe that's why you were a little bit more disappointed with the finale of that first series, because the entirety was just to get to the next series. 
in some aspects versus this kind of finality and conclusion that tied off all those loose ends. Yeah. And that's, that's going to be what the author's choice has done. I think that's something that a lot of fantasy authors can look at is being able to tell what your story is in a lot of different cases and not ultimately worry about how it may be received. Worry about kind of where you're going and making sure that the journey, at least for the most part, it still is going to have to have some sort of ending that is satisfying. And that's where I think looking at these two as kind of counterparts between Return of the King being like, yep, that's the end of it, that's the trilogy right there, versus this kind of expanding universe that's kind of pushing in a new direction. Yeah. It just shows a lot of these other things of fiction. There's not really a right or wrong way to do it. There's tropes you can learn, there's things you can do, and a lot of people know what's wrong, but it just kind of comes down to being able to make sure that the story is told and people are able to enjoy it, learn from it, and kind of go then about the regular <laughs> bit of their lives after that. Yeah. So, overall, even without the Skeleton Chronicles, these four books, I would definitely recommend to people. They're not everyone's cup of tea. If you're not into dark fantasy or grim dark, this is definitely not something you're going to enjoy. Yeah. And Ben Galley's writing style does take a bit of time to get used to. There are some... These are self-published novels. Mm -hmm. And it shows. Especially in these last two books. Um, there are some like grammatical things that are just placed throughout. It's not horrible, but when it does happen, mm -hmm. it takes you out of it a little bit. Mm -hmm. So just like a word of caution in that respect. But this is the book series... At the end of 2019, I didn't like to read at all. Mm -hmm. These, This is the book series that got me back into reading fantasy. And at, maybe I'm biased because of that. Because it it got me back into reading. It got me into read. I wouldn't have read The Lord of the Rings if it wasn't for the Emanesca series. I wouldn't have started Lightbringer or The Poppy War. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have finished my own novel mm -hmm. that I that I recently finished writing. None of that would have happened if it wasn't for that series. Hmm. But even still, I would say if you enjoy Dark Fantasy or Grimdark even a little bit, that you need to at least try the first book and see if you like where it's going from there. Mm -hmm. And that's all I would <laughs> all I would say about the Ebenezka series. It's not going to be everyone's cup of tea, but if if you're down for this dark story about how people's actions have consequences, then yeah, definitely check it out. So yeah, this has been Folk Tales and Fantasy. My name is Cameron Michaels. If you would like to message me, ask me if you have any requests for anything you'd like me to read, you can email me at folktalespod at gmail.com or DM me at Cameron I G Michaels on Instagram. Like you have uh, anything you'd like to add? Anything? No, I wish I could. At least the one thing I'm trying to work on is getting back onto more of like a fiction and fantasy writing. I uh, secured the um, at on Twitter for Pun Slinger a long, long time ago versus Gunslinger, and I still never actually used all of that. So uh, in the meantime, at least uh, just be able to kind of follow. I do some sports writing and some other aspects, but. Hopefully can jump back more into it for the most part. It'd be fun to find some sort of thing. I wish I had more I could reach out or tag for the most part. But yeah, you know, the email if you want to reach me would be at um, uh, socialmediablake at gmail.com. If for, you're listening to this podcast, you're like, ah, oh, Blake seems cool for all that stuff. What's going on? You can just email me there. Awesome. Blake, thank you so much for uh, spending like an hour of us talking about the Lord of the Rings and the Emanesca series. I really sure. appreciate it. Hey, anytime. And I will catch you guys next time. See you later.